Hey everybody, welcome to this episode of the Game Detectives Podcast. Every episode, we're going to talk about a game or a game series, what we like, what we don't, as well as some lessons we can take away from the game. We hope you enjoy this episode. Hey everybody, welcome to this episode of the Game Detectives podcast. I am joined by all three of my very good friends once again. We're all back together. So Travis, Eli, and Cusack are all here, and we're going to be talking about some of our favorite video game music, because we love to fight about music, especially when it comes to Breath of the Wild. <laughs> controversial topic or we all we all just love to talk about music so we're like why not make a video about it um so what we're going to be doing is we're going to share our top three songs each and well not top but just like three songs we like i gotta say this was a a very hard list to make yeah you know i and Mm -hmm. i honestly think if it were some other time, I probably would have picked an entirely different list because there's so much music yeah, out absolutely. there. Absolutely, it's, it's fine. Yeah, yeah. So we're gonna we're just gonna go and and talk about our some of our favorite songs right now and why we chose them. So I'm I'm I'll start with the first one. Um, and the theme I kind of designed mine around is to choose one from childhood, one from like my teenage years, and then one from the adult me i'm actually gonna start with the middle one which is um ice cap zone act two from sonic three um it's a it's a really good one um Mm. travis and i briefly talked about it before we started but michael jackson may or may not be connected to this track so it's very exciting even if he isn't though um Mm. what i like about it is that it's very like influenced by 80s pop and kind of 90s but more so 80s where you have a lot of obviously like the synthesizers and all of the instrumentation you can use is kind of limited for this time period when it was made but it's also very it's all like layered so if you go and listen to it and I'm going to put the links in the description for all the music um, if you're listening on YouTube if you go take a listen to it it's basically like five or six instruments that play the same thing over and over again. But what's so great about it is that it layers it all um, in different ways throughout the piece. And it does so in a way where it's not completely predictable how the layers are going to kind of span out through the two minutes of the piece. So you might have like the the drum beat and the bass in the beginning and it might sound like it's going to repeat to that just drum beat and bass in the middle again, but then it switches it up and it kind of keeps you off track of like what exactly it's going to happen next. And what I like about it too, is uh, this is obviously very different from the uh, kind of stereotypical, like triple a music of today where it's not too focused on like melody either. It's more kind of like the feel and the vibe. Um, And it has a melody that comes in for like four bars at a time, but most of the time it's just really doing like background music, backbeat, um, you know, synthesizer, bass, that kind of stuff. Um, And I think it makes it really interesting compared to a lot of video game music of the time, because a lot of a lot of platformer, even now, a lot of platformer music are pretty predictable because you don't want the music to like stick out too much. Yeah, and it is almost always melody based, mm-hmm. like you were saying, especially in platformers and especially ones kind of aimed towards children. Yeah, so like this one is fun because mm-hmm. the act one of Ice Cap Zone, the melody is much more consistent throughout that one, and then Act Two is the remix of the Act One. Um, and so you still get the melody of act one in the act two part, but then it's more, it's more so, I don't want to say it an accompaniment, but it's more so like a segment that gets played out throughout rather than like the main emphasis of the song, even though it's the melody. Here's here. I got two questions. I got mm. two questions for you about ice cap zone. Um, not that this matters, but when you close your eyes and listen to this song, what I wonder 
more so than a lot. Of, I guess when you think of Sonic music and when I think of Sonic music are two very different things. In fact, I almost was going to put a Sonic song on here <laughs> and call 3D Sonic a different series because it's a whole different beast. Oh, yeah. But here's my question to you. When you close your eyes and listen to this, do you hear Sonic? This is my first question. And number two, do you hear that this is an ice level? So I was, I, I wrote a little note about that and I think it's cool. So there, the reason why I think of an ice level when like looking at the different layers is because this, there's like a 16th note backbeat that keeps going throughout. Um, but the third, so like the mm-hmm. third 16th note within a group of four 16th notes isn't right on beat. So it's kind of got this weird, like, they call it a hemiola kind of, well, it's actually not hemiola, but it like, it's kind of this thing where it's not an actually like consistent beat throughout. It's got a it's weird- It's slippy and slidey. It's slippy and slidey, right? So like, it's a really small thing because everything else sounds so typical, but like, then you have this weird 16th note that has like a little misplacement to it that makes it like feel like it's not completely settling in. I'm doing a lot of movements. <laughs> what I love what I love about this one is that it it does evoke ice level and I think it does a good job. I think a lot of games that have ice or snow levels fall into the trap of it sounding Christmassy. Yes. Like like bells or chimes or stuff. And I don't want to think Christmas, I want to think ice because this is like a treacherous mountain. Mm-hmm. It's not Santa's village. So that was something I really appreciated with this one. Yeah, and like the the tone they have mm-hmm they're using with like the synthesizer melody is also just like the way I can't really describe it, but it's like almost, it's kind of like a muted sound where like, it's not fully like articulating the sound, but it's more kind of like a wah wah. Like, Mm -hmm. I don't know how else to describe it, but, but it, it kind of also the slipperiness of it. It's like the notes aren't clearly, the melody isn't clearly articulate either um, in terms of like, how exactly mm-hmm. it's not like right on beat it's not like a march where you know everything's all so so i've never played a sonic game in my life like i mean the only one i can say that i've played is sonic heroes um you played sonic in the black knight <laughs> oh yeah i, did play I played one. it too I um beat it twice. <laughs> but i loved <laughs> listening to this one because i was like really really inspired by it um which i didn't think i could say coming from a sonic game just because well, you should really listen to the sonic coming. mania soundtrack man if you if you oh, vibe so with good. this yeah it's sonic so mania good. is an incredible soundtrack it's yeah. out of this world i i, I finally beat that yeah. one and it's got some insane tracks on there i was thinking about putting studiopolis on here yeah i love <laughs> it yeah. oh that one's so good it's so good one of the things I just wanted to mention was like the fact that this game is like pretty dated and the fact that the they there was like some serious limitations on like the how they could make their music. It's sixteen bit music and like you can't even tell. Like it's really, really impressive. I think that was one of the few advantages that the Genesis had over the Super Nintendo was it did have a more complex sound chip. Yeah. I think they could do a lot more instrumentation with it than they could on Super Nintendo. But what I what I was reading um was that there's a part of the song where if you collect a ring while you're while that part of the song is playing, you won't hear any music at all just because like they only use like one part oh. of the file and that intercepts yeah. with the uh, the part of the sound chip that like it makes the sound when you collect a ring. The 16th note beat, like a comp- the 16th note counter is where that part exists. Yeah, they have a pretty high limit on tracks you can have. It was that case with a lot of Nintendo 64 games, yeah. too, where tracks would overlap or go out just because of the limitations yeah. they had there. So I, I, that's, and I also chose it because my next one is like nowhere near as fun, but it's like a really, it's a fun, it's like a fun song for an ice level, but it also is just like really cool, thought out really well. And this is something that I think I'm going to kind of come back to when I'm talking about music is that it has like a very explicit like focus and direction and purpose behind it, which is th- which I think is like really necessary for music, because what you get with a lot of these AAA games is they're like, well, it's a fantasy game, so we're just going to have the generic strings and we're going to have we're like going to make a melody, but we're just going to like kind of do it. And you see the same thing, I think, with like Marvel movies, too, and just kind of those the triple a things where it's like the 
the music isn't necessarily like made in the thought process of the th- of the product and this feels like a song that was like very much made like how are we going to relate this to an ice world yeah well it's like uncharted music or it's the same thing as marvel music where it's like okay it's epic strings uh, it doesn't matter just a lot of strings yeah. you're good so eli in korea yeah well speaking of speaking of epic strings uh i want i wouldn't wanted to bring up uh so my first one is England Map Overworld from Yu-Gi-Oh! Duelist of the Roses, which is like such an interesting choice for me because I would never think that like I would put a Yu-Gi-Oh! game on on my list here. Uh but I think it's just like from where I am at this point in life. Like I was I've been watching uh JoJo's Bizarre Adventure and I was watching it and they had a really, really similar motif in, in the backing track of the song or in, of the show. And I was like, wait, I totally know that. What is that? And I went to YouTube and I was like, went down the YouTube rabbit hole and I rediscovered this soundtrack. And I was like, holy shit. It's like the same thing. Um, and both of them are so effective in doing what they're doing, which is, like, it's very, like, dramatic and, uh, epic. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that this one, this use of strings is necessarily, like, epic, like you were talking about, like, really, like, um, yeah, dramatic, but, uh, anyway. So the game is set during the War of the Roses, which I think is a really interesting setting for, uh a Yu-Gi-Oh game uh like the the English civil war in like the 15th century um and this is the theme that you see for like the world map uh so when you like go and you're like exploring like this map of England and like going to these different dual locations um you're listening to this track and it just makes the world feel a lot bigger than it is because it's definitely like just like a like a world select map. So they could just um you know like give you a list and be like okay here's the next place that you're supposed to duel but they instead they like chose to do like a map of England and you're like in this little sailboat and you're like traveling along and then this music is in the background and I swear to god I would like sit in front of my TV when I was a kid um it's just so evocative for me, like sitting and just listening to the music and being like, ah, yeah, like, you know, kind of like grooving out to it with my little brother. Um, yeah, it's just like classy. It brings the game, like a Yu-Gi-Oh game to this level of classiness that I think kind of differentiates it from like Pokemon or Digimon, um, in the sense that it like really wants to take itself seriously. You know, like, I feel like Pokemon, I, it, see, it just seems like a little bit more, the music is a little bit more, like, lighthearted or, like, kitty, and Yu-Gi-Oh! is very, like, like, ah, uh, like, I want, I want people, you know, like, yeah, it's, like, dramatic. I always thought that Yu-Gi-Oh! was kind of like the show that tried to help, you know, eight to ten year olds get serious about something. Right. Like, you know, like it was still for that crowd, but more they try to make things more at stake, mm. which made it more interesting, even though it was just dueling with cards. Right. Um. You know, so I I gave the tune a listen. Uh, and and I don't know because I never played a Yu Gi Oh game ever, but I did watch the anime a lot when I was a kid, mm-hmm. and I definitely felt there was a bit of a quite a tone difference between that and pokemon's had that kind of deal too where you know the you know the tone of the show is different from the tone of the video games Mm. so uh, i guess my question for you then is like when you feel kind of that way do you feel that this game kind of has its own flavor of Oh? because i always kind of thought the games kind of had like with pokemon for example like i feel that you know the 
the pixelated Pokemon is almost 100% different than the anime. Yeah. Even though they're technically the same franchise. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. And it's such a weird direction to take the game, right? Like, here's this game about, like, Egypt myth Egyptian mythology. Let's set it in 15th century England. Um, such a weird choice. But actually, I think... So it's totally different than the anime. Like, uh... Mm -hmm. So Yugi is, you see his portrait, but he is like Henry Tudor in the game. So oh, okay. it's really a bizarre choice. And I'm really curious like why they made those choices. But I think it, it's exactly like what I was saying is they just like wanted to take, they wanted their players to really take the game seriously or like set it to this level of sophistication where, you know, they can have these like really, really, um, superficial battles that are it's just like so classic like high level sophisticated like millions of people are dying but we're aristocrats so we're gonna have our like our card games you know to to battle it out so it, i think it works really well it's interesting that you brought up uh jojo's bizarre adventure earlier i was wondering do you think there's a weird kind of piggyback thing where the manga for jojo's came out first and then Yu-Gi-Oh! was another very shonen manga, which took inspiration from JoJo, but then uh, the Yu-Gi-Oh! TV show, video games, all that media came out, and then the JoJo anime was then inspired by the media, you know, kind of like one inspired the other back and forth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, yeah, it, they, to me, both of them remind me of that it's just very quintessential anime, like, where I, I almost want to call it, like, aristocratic anime. Do you know what I mean? Um, where, like, I feel like in order to appeal to Western audiences, I'm totally making this up, but, like, um, in order to appeal to Western audiences, they just, like, create this very, like, Western-style music or, like, orchestrated music. Um, I don't know. That's what I kind of think of when I compare the two. What I'm thinking about, like with the game and the set and the music, it's very much talking about like the iconography of it rather. Mm -hmm. It's right. It's not. And it's not trying to be like, this is what <laughs> the War of the Roses was like. Right. Mm -hmm. It's it's creating it's creating a world and an environment that is a that isn't like a representation of the War of the Roses era, but it's, like, drawing on the iconography of that yes. era and the style yes. of music from that era. So, like, it's it's not... It's, like, being, like, let's talk about, like, or let's use the assets of the iconography of, uh, I don't know, the aristocratic music, and let's use mm -hmm. that to imbue the game to, like, give it this kind of, you know environment that you yeah. yeah and that's a very anime thing to do I, they they do that with a lot of kind of almost like a using a period or a, something as a set piece basically we're not retelling it we're not adapting mm -hmm. it but we are taking a lot from it mm -hmm. yeah yeah I, and i think like the only thing that i guess the the story is it's really confusing and convoluted and it's just like you know a, a backdrop for you to play the game like like a lot of other games, but, um, <laughs> it, yeah, it's, I mean, it works really well though. Cause you've got like Yugi and he's like the Lancasters and then you've got Seto Kaiba and he's the Yorkists and um, oh, I buy it. I buy it. Yeah. Yeah. It works. It works. It's great. That's all I got to say about that. Thanks. Trav, you're up next, bruh. So I kind of knew going into this that I wouldn't be able to analyze or dissect music to the level I think anybody else could hear. I think the three of you are all significantly more musically acclimated. I can't, you know, tell you. Hey, we were quarter. all in. We were all in a cappella <laughs> choir sure. together. Yeah, sure. but if you notice, whenever I was in something with you, I was always in a position where you don't hear or wasn't allowed. I was to about sing. to say I was the only <laughs> bass who actually sang, but we were still in it together. <laughs> <laughs> David, David. Sometimes I would join yes, you though you as would. a baritone every you once in a while, would. and then but typically I was a tenor. Yes. So I, I, I wanted basically to, couldn't do that. <clears throat> so I wanted to take the approach of 
what are I, I like simple melodies. I like memorable stuff, but songs that can kind of tell you more about the worlds or the characters or even the creators themselves. And I wanted to all go with contemporary songs just because, you know, I could talk about Super Mario World or stuff a million times. But I just wanted to challenge myself with that. Also, songs that we didn't already talk about in Game Detectives proper episodes. Yeah, we have a top five songs video, and I'm going to link that in... I'm going to do one of those pop-in things in the YouTube video. Oh, an annotation? Yeah, yeah. annotation. This, this video is already better than that one, I think. <laughs> uh, so my first song is Megalovania, which I'm surprised Cusack didn't already pick. Um, you you dibs it. it. <laughs> yeah, you freaking dibs it, and I was really upset. I was like, dang it! <laughs> And, this, I, and I didn't want to pick another Undertale one, because then I'd just be copying you. you. Um, so I went on my <laughs> own way. So there's a lot of reasons why I picked this song. Obviously, it's great for the moment. It's memorable. Everybody knows this song. Um, but what I really like is, you know, what's been talked, I think we even talked about it on the show, is the history entwined with it. That this was a song that the composer had had in his pocket for a long time. And as a creative type, that's kind of one of my favorite things to do is to not just, you know, draw from the past in a very basic sense, but literally take things you've created a long time ago and repurpose them um, completely differently. I don't think when people do that, they're doing it for no reason. I think when you repurpose something like that, you're doing it for a very intentional and very personal reason. It's something I like to do all the time. So I just love that touch to it. I also love how, again, it's such a simple thing from such a small place that became this this monument. I hear this song almost every mm. freaking day. It's maybe, not maybe. just Undertale. It's in the memes. It's in Super Smash Brothers. Every time I play Super Smash Brothers, I play Tycho. <laughs> I play Tycho drum all the time. This song's in that. It's everywhere. It's a beast. It's a behemoth. It is something that I think will be around for a very long time. But I, I, I don't think that the composer, uh, Toby Fox, had that in mind for a fraction of a second when he first came up with this mm -hmm. melody. And I just really mm -hmm. enjoy the story that comes from the history of it. Um, and I really don't have much to say about the composition or the melody. It's okay. I mean, mu music can be described more than just the technicality of how, it, you know, how it's made. But the only, you know, I think yeah. I always had an appreciation for the song, you know, mostly because of where the story is in Undertale mm -hmm. at that point. At this point, you finally come up to this character who has absolutely, for on most occasions, forgiven you for a bunch of stuff. I mean, the only time he actually rewards you is when you are a good person throughout the game. Otherwise, he even forgives you killing his brother. And, you know, if you if you do it and then spare other people, he's he's angry at you. And, and there's a cool segment of that. But he that when you destroy everything, this is when Sans is like, I've had enough of you. Yeah. And you're you're and you're about to pay. And that mm -hmm. and the song, when it hits, mm -hmm. I always was just like, oh, mm -hmm. we stepped into some dangerous grounds. And even no matter how many times I, I try playing it and no matter how many times I hear it, I always feel that, yeah. you know, it does this is the feeling. song you done messed up. Yeah. That's how I always kind of think of it. I and think, I think oh, oh. the creator is telling us something, not just about in the context of the character of Sans in there. I don't know. I almost feel like there's something about almost like a frustration or like a, like a venting out about just the way that song is just so heavy. Yeah, and it I can keeps see that. Building and building and building. It feels like a like a stress release or something like that. I was gonna say mm -hmm. the thing that I love most about Megalovania and a couple of the other songs that we discuss will discuss later um, is that it has a build up and it has like this sounds really basic. It has different. It has like piano. It has forte. It has different dynamics. It mm -hmm. it like. It's a piece. It's no, purposeful. It's, it's purposeful. And yeah. it's like, he had to think like, how am I going to take it and like, just start with the melody and then expand it. And uh, again, with kind of going back to the layers and what I'm really enjoying about like some of the songs I'm listening to right now, when I, um, 
like listen even to popular music it's like i like music that can figure out how to add the layers and don't and not just doing the same thing over and over again all at the same like you can have different voices but if it's all the same dynamic the whole time it can get a bit repetitive yeah i think it's so interesting how it's like you know it's really catchy but you can't (laughs) sing it you physically can't sing oh i do i oh yeah you can (laughs) <laughs> it always sounds silly and and again it, you, there's no way you can like match it for what it is even though yeah. it's just a simple melody like that takes real skill to be able to write something that um is not singable but catchy like that's really pretty tricky i think you see that a lot in video game music though yes i think that's the place where do. you can play around with it yeah definitely definitely I, I love that. And I think the syncopation of the whole thing is really what gives it that groove and that like catchiness. Uh, it's so exhausting, cool. though. It's long and you're tired and you've had to hear it five million times because you can't beat that fight. And it gets to that <laughs> point where it's like, boom, brr, boom, brr, boom, brr, boom, brr, and it's zooming in the middle. It just, yeah. it, you're, you feel like you just got out of a battle just listening to it. Yeah. What mm. I think is funny, too, or not funny, but very interesting is that. Um, if I'm correct, I pre- I thought I read somewhere that this song was meant to kind of represent a skeleton dance, if that makes sense. Mm. Um, I thought I thought um, Toby Fox mentioned that that's kind of what his intention was, but I mean I mean I'm fair again. That's just what I I thought I remember. I, I don't know if it's true or not. And when I do think about it, I do kind of think, yeah, I guess it it could kind of be that way, especially if you had a group of them doing some sort of like. Michael Jackson dance or something, you know, and <laughs> wow, I, I don't know. I was just thinking that, Epic. but uh, but and then what also kind of made me think of that is there's another song in Undertale, you know, that's the spider dance, which also kind of represents what like a spider would dance like. So and 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 when I think about it now, I do kind of think you know I could totally imagine like a group of skeletons dancing to Megalovania at like a Halloween party or something. It's the new Monster Bash. Oh yeah, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Okay, right. that's enough memes. Yeah. Zach, <laughs> you're up next. I'm going to start off the Mario train. Let's do this. So, uh, I think I, I, I worry, I worried that some of the ones I picked were a little obvious, but I, they still come t- from a good place. So, the very first Mario game I ever played was Super Mario World on the Super Nintendo. And... The reason why I chose this one, because there's a plethora of just amazing Mario songs, you know. I mean, uh, I could rant forever about that. But I think the reason why I was so drawn to this one was not only because of nostalgia, but I specifically, you know, put in our list the fact of what happens to that theme when you're riding Yoshi. So I, I don't know if you guys have caught on to this but if you play the game it's like da 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 and it's like you know the simple theme that we all know but when you're riding yoshi it actually adds a little bongo Mm -hmm. to how you go about it and i always thought that was such a neat little thing you know uh as because because i always forget that the super mario world is actually a dinosaur world that's kind of the theme that they're going with and you know, not only does the song kind of make me think of dinosaurs, but so does the bongos specifically, kind of like you're on a marching T-Rex or something. Yeah, kind of like the Flintstones um, or something. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's a great comparison. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And I think I just really enjoy, you know, if you're going to compare it to some of the other original Mario songs, they kind of have like a da, 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 like kind of a simple one. But I always felt that this one really stood out. Because it, you know, it doesn't sound simple to me. It sounds a little bit more, it it feels like it actually kind of has, you know, a tone of just delightful happiness that the other ones seem happy too, like the simple da-da-da-da-da-da-da. But I always kind of felt that the Mario World theme had such a cool, uplifting feeling when you were starting off on a big, sunny Mario level, you know, learning that. Once you're on a Yoshi and you click another Yoshi box, you get a another life. Or uh, when you get the cape, you get to fly. And I always kind of felt that this theme was really good at encapsulating those fun concepts of the game. Um, I also really enjoy, and again, this is just a side note, but how future Mario games 
will call back to that theme as well as other original themes. And, you know, I, and, and, and they'll play it some other different way or a different tempo and such. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that's kind of my piece about it. It's, it's probably nostalgic. It's probably, you know, in my head all the time because I've just heard it so many times throughout growing up and such, but I don't know. I, I really think the Yoshi aspect is cool. Am I right that they do that same bongo effect in uh, Mario Sunshine when he rides him as like a throwback? I've never played that one, so I guess I wouldn't know. Do they do it in Galaxy as well? I believe they do it in Galaxy and Super Mario Sunshine. No, yeah, Galaxy 2, that's the one he's yep, in. Galaxy yeah. 2. Yep. yep. And I think that's kind of cool because that was the first game Yoshi was ever put in there. And, you know, I actually kind of forgot the newer games did that. And I think that's such a fun little characteristic to give to Yoshi, you know, especially when you know it's happened from the very beginning of his character. Yeah, it's it's light and bouncy. It works well with the melody, too, which it, sound, it sounds kind of like a steel drum like mm-hmm. or something like that the, mm-hmm. the 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 instrument of the melody is mm-hmm. and so mm-hmm. I, I kind of like that if with the super mario world theme because then you're also if they're trying to do that prehistoric ish kind of mm-hmm. you know dinosaur it makes sense to have some more of those drum style instruments you know as the theme Whereas having an oboe or a bassoon or, you know, an instrument that's been developed over the course of seven, you know, hundred years versus like a drum, Mm -hmm. which is kind of a more simplistic instrument, um, I think like maybe achieves that a little more. Again, kind of like the iconography, like we talked about before. Mm -hmm. Um, I like how more technically it changes the groove of the piece. Like, I think Koji Kondo is really masterful in the way that he like can take all these instruments and give them different melodies and then superimpose them on each other. And it just like totally builds this idea and you can sing like every single melody in, in the song, right? Like there's and then there's, and then there's, yeah. What's cool. even cooler too is that there's another theme in that game with the exact same, you know, deal, but it's a hon- I think it's a honky tonk piano. Mm. You know, there's two different versions of that song and uh I I don't know. I always I think it's kind of cool when a game, you know, has a concept and they can make two separate things <laughs> from the, uh, just one melody. Mm. What were you going to say, cool. Travis? Sorry, Travis, you were going to say something. Oh, I was just thinking, too, Koji Kondo does the same thing with the uh, slide music in Mario 64. It's also in Mario Kart. I don't know if you know the song that I'm thinking about, where it's like the... And then it's like got the banjo track that's like... And it's like two completely different melodies, but it's like they're kind of fighting each other. It's cool. Yeah. Well... We're going to my second one, and it's also a Koji Kondo piece, but it's very different. I would say it's like kind of the opposite um, of what Cusack's talking about for, I think, really good reasons. So I I had to do Legend of Zelda 1, uh, the, and the Game Detective's like top five songs video, I did Gerudo Valley, because that's just like so good and mm. perfect, and I could talk about it forever. Um, one I want to talk about that I think just from my perusal of YouTube isn't talked about a lot, which I think actually deserves a lot of discussion is the, well, I've seen it called last five minutes or the final hours of, I think it's credited as final hours on the Majora's Mask soundtrack. And it's, um, it's this very haunting melody. It's right at the end of the cycle, the three day cycle of Majora's Mask where you see the moon is like really right above you about to smush you and everybody for all eternity. Um, What I like about the final hours is that it's hard to get. um, uh, I forget. There's some like technical term in the academic books. I I think it's called diegetic music. I'm not sure actually what it does really well. Diegetic Diegetic would be music that exists in the world of the game. Yeah. So it's like, it's it's like kind of both non and 
it's both mm, kind of diegetic and not because because um what really does it so like the main melody is just strings um and it's kind of like a choral piece almost where it's just kind of slow moving chords and suspensions all you know massing around each other very very simple chord progressions um kind of very typical ones nothing too challenging but um it still like does a really good job of like setting the tone and everything what really i think pushes it over the top for me is that it also really expertly like includes sounds from the game um in the melody so the the version of it that i'm going to be linking in the description it includes the bells from the game because you actually can't find you actually can't find any like i think the official one just has the music but when you play the game the bells like from the clock town are ringing you can hear the earthquakes you know and it kind of melds with the music in a way that makes sense because it's it's a very dreary song and the sounds that are the only two sounds you can hear are the bells and the earthquakes and it all just like combines together into one neat package but what really lets the earthquakes and the bells and those sound effects shine is the fact that it's the kind of this long drawn out melody with lots of harmony around it so you can still keep track of how all the chords are moving but then you can appreciate how the sounds coming from your environment are interacting with the music. Um, and that's, I think really something that's hard to do in a game where you have a sound that is within the game that isn't directly tied to the music track, but you're still able to make it feel like the music and the sounds are all combining into one. Um, like it's a great piece on its own, but I think the way that it really kind of incorporates all the dread of everything happening in the actual world of the game, you know, outside of the music track, I think is really excellent. And this, there are composers that do it really well. I think Koji Kondo was extremely good at it. And he's obviously very, very, um, he can write all kinds of music. Um, uh, so I think this is just another example of like, it's not very complicated, but it's really effective in what it's trying to do. It's trying to communicate that dread, that overwhelming sense of, you know, demise, I think, really well. Sorry, I just have a quick question. How does the world end? With a whisper or a bang? It ends with a... What? That was very Korean, sorry. I... <laughs> Go for it. Sorry. I, I was just going to say, you know, uh, I've played bits and pieces of Majora's Mask, but I know enough of it to know what goes on. I need to seriously kind of play the whole thing in order, I think, to get the the real full picture. But I have, you know, I mean, whenever you play that game, you're like, what does happen when you just run out the clock? And it's so, and it does, it, it's not satisfying. Like, I met, like, even just a small glimpse of you know, the world ending and Link screaming. And then you see the mask. It, it, it's, you know, this song really encapsulates, you know, sorrow, tr- you know, fear and panic at the same time. And it's almost like the game is saying, if you don't do something, this is your fault. Hmm. Mm-hmm. And maybe that's just my opinion. Maybe that's just how I feel. But like, you know, especially with the bell. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just like, hey, you know, you're getting close. And this is like the number one Zelda game when I have played it. I have the most anxiety. Yeah, <laughs> it's not it's not a relaxing oh. game, that's for sure. No, no, no. This no, song no, is... reminds me of when I have to leave the house during quarantine and things are starting to open up in Milwaukee and you see all these people like just walking around pretending it's everything's like back to normal and fine. That's what this song reminds me of. Like the people in Clock Town. Mm-hmm. I I'm thinking really I'm comparison. thinking about making a video about that kind of, but you can Oh, I just it. had the idea, so I texted it in our group chat like a week ago, so. Oh dang. 
What an interesting choice, it. though, to like make for your final hours to be really somber. And because every other game, the time the time is running out, do you play this like weird, eerie track? Like, no, you play like you know like it's like really like or the music gets faster yeah it gets faster this music is like it's there's no time it's almost like timeless and it's like there so the synth on this it's like really like um kind of tinkery but there's yeah there's no there's no attack on the sound so it's like simultaneously like really fast but also really slow because you can't like make out where the time is or like what when they're playing i think it's really it almost anticipates like the nothingness that will happen when it's over yeah Mm. yeah Mm. it's just it's it's i think it's one of the few like it's one of the few songs that really like kind of makes me feel like like you said, anxious, but also kind of like scared and also afraid without it resorting to, you know, like dramatic, like typical, like horror style with like screech, you know, violin screeches and that kind of stuff. Like, obviously that is pretty popular for horror thing, but I think mm-hmm. this is a, a different kind of horror almost. It's like, yeah, it's like what Eli is saying. Like, the it's, I mean, the game's about death and death isn't about big, scary, bombastic things. Death is about like not understanding time and like things kind of being confusing and weird more so than it is about like horror. Yeah. It's uncomfortable. <clears throat> all right, Eli. Yeah. With that, right. <laughs> we're going to you. <laughs> I'm I'm so glad we just had two things about Koji Kondo cuz mine is so closely attached to Koji Kondo without being Koji Kondo. Um so my next one is Breath of the Wild. <laughs> uh, here we go. All right. So very controversial s- subject, right? But I've done my research. Um, I'm ready. So I chose Horse Knight, although I could have chosen any piece in the OST of Breath of the Wild because I just love, love, love this music. It's so good. It has impacted me so much as a composer, as a player. Like, it's just really changed how I view video games. Um, and I really want to credit the composer, Manaka Kataoka, who also wrote the music for Animal Crossing New Leaf, interestingly. Um, great game. Um, really? I thought it was that other guy. Well, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She did, I believe. Let me double check that. I feel like I... No, I feel like I'm not. I, I might have missed something. Why? What's controversial about this choice? Ooh, She's a okay, woman. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get into Sorry. Travis. May, I, you might have been getting there. Sorry. <laughs> no, okay. no, that's not um, the controversy. So oh. I chose this one because it's my favorite. Um, it's mine so, too. Yeah, it's such a cool, oh, so and it's very, it's very like quintessential of like what the composer is trying to do, which is like invoke minimalism into video games, which is really cool. Um, so this piece has, like, a piano theme that's kind of, like, really jumpy and, like, skittery for, um, the horse theme. Like, uh, I can't, I can hear it, but I can't really sing it. Um. Yeah, it's like, yeah, it's, it kind of reminds me of trotting. Yeah, it's really, it's definitely, like, it got a gallop to it. That's how I always viewed it. Yeah. Yeah, like a gallop or like a trot or just kind of what it kind of, you know, music that encapsulates peacefully riding a horse. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. But it's also quiet, which I like. Um, it the allows whole soundtrack, you to, yeah, is very understated. Mm-hmm. It allows you to, like, really appreciate the ambiance of the open world and just the grandeur of it. Like, I feel like Nintendo was really they realized that if they're going to make an open world game, it's not going to be like any other Legend of Zelda game that they've made before. And yeah, yeah I think I heard somebody breathe. Yeah, uh, that was so th- the Legend of Zelda has always kind of had this idea of the natural world. Um, like it, that's always been kind of an inspiration is the is like going into nature to escape. It is an escape from reality by going through the natural world. So I think like this song makes sense with that, even though it's not necessarily like 
the kind of typical Legend of Zelda music, but it makes sense that they want the player to, like, take in the natural world around them. And I think, like Cusack was saying, where you have this piece that is very understated, right? It's nighttime. They want to they want to events that like not a lot is moving or rustling mm-hmm. or, you know, just mm-hmm. kind of the natural world taking its mm-hmm. kind of it's slowing down a little bit. And like yeah. it contrasts that with this very like kind of scattered melody. It has mm-hmm. like a very soft melody um, kind of counter <laughs> like second melody with the violin. Yeah. Um, yeah but it's all very like understated and very much like trying to be like under the guise of night yeah all of the music feels like a memory to me like when you listen to it you hear like the you hear like what the natural world but then like i think a minute into the song you can hear the main theme or is it uh it's either zelda's lullaby or um hyrule field theme just played on like a singular violin um it's an it's an edited version of the main theme. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's I think it it does so well because like Link has been asleep for a hundred years. You know he's waking up. He's trying to remember like his past life, but it's just not quite coming to him. And you just get these moments where it's like it's like he kind of remembers it, but then it just goes back to the main theme. Um, it's. Oh, I have chills. It's so cool. <laughs> I ca- I kind of like what you say about you know, y- you know, it represents kind of how he feels after he's waking up because Zelda has always been really good at making music that match what the weather is, mm. whether it's sunny, dark, light, raining, and stuff like that. And uh, yeah, I felt like this game did a really good job at kind of representing what your environment was, you know, whether it was night, day, or cold hot you know th- there's a lot of aspects that kind of represent feelings with or perspectives with the music in zelda yeah well it's not my favorite soundtrack what i do really appreciate about this is i think the whole kind of idea with breath of the wild is zelda has always been exactly what zelda is and then somebody says well what if we do something different well we can't do that it's not zelda well what is zelda it's the same thing with the soundtrack for 30 years what Zelda sounds like has been incredibly consistent. And mm-hmm. I somebody at some point had to go, well, Zelda doesn't have to sound the way it's always sound. We can try something different. And I appreciate that because Nendo, Nintendo is usually very resilient to doing things any differently than how they've always done it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, very resistant mm-hmm. to it. So mm-hmm. the the controversy that we alluded to before is basically just people were kind of among other things in the game, like the soundtrack was very different from what you'd expect from a, a Legend of Zelda game. And Contentious, that, yeah. Yeah, so like that led a lot of people to disliking the soundtrack because it was different from what they expected and what was... But like Eli and everybody else has been saying, it's really great in how it's using the environment to reflect it. Well, I was going to say, one of the biggest things, I think I mentioned this before, um, but the utilization of dynamics in that game was so fun because, you know, when one of those guardians spotted you, the piano creep, it, it doesn't just, it, it, it creeps up on you. Mm-hmm. You know, the piano does, and it slowly gets louder. And then you start to panic. Like, where is it? Yeah. <laughs> you know, and then boom, you get lasered. You're dead. Mm-hmm. And it, 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 it kind of reminded <laughs> me yeah. of like, you know, I, I don't know. I just kind of like how, you know, it's not like Jaws where it's just dun, 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 dun. It was just like, dun, 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 dun. Yeah. and then you're like, oh my gosh, something's creeping up on me. I'm about to get, I'm about to get nailed. And I, I, I oddly found more panic and anxiety through that, you know, little creeping piano than, you know, some other themes that have really tried to like, quote unquote, be scary. If you listen to the main theme of the, of the piece of the game, sorry, um, the it climaxes and the main instrument is an is an urhu which i think is such a cool choice i what love the heck that. Is that it's a it's like a like a chinese uh violin Person? it's like the stringed instrument it's it's um it's really you would probably hear it like it's probably used in the Avatar theme song, I would think. Yeah. Or like something oh, yeah. similar. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's it has it a definitive a very... sound. You would un- 
Yeah. You would know it when you hear it. Is it used in Mulan? Oh, yeah. I thought... Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's that, it's I, I, yeah. that's one I can think of. But just like the use of traditional like Eastern Asian instruments in like mainstream orchestration, like and at the climax of the main thing, it just is so inspiring to me that Nintendo is willing to like um I don't think you would see that in other games. I mean, I don't think they've done that before. It's just like a really cool move to make. Um, it's a company and... putting more trust into its creators, which I think is a really good mm-hmm. thing. They're a company is basically saying that they trust the intuition and creativity of a composer more than they do their own ego, and I think that's incredibly important. Or their, you know, last last semester dividends. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, Trav, what what you got next? All right, so we had Zelda, Mario, and then Zelda again. I'm taking it in a little different direction. My second pick is actually Your Reality from Doki Doki Literature Mm. Club. I knew when we were putting this together that I wanted to do one of my songs that had lyrics. And I I thought about, I know, uh, I thought about doing one or two, Snake Eater or some other ones like that. But. What I really like about this is I think the whole soundtrack in general, it's incredibly simple. Um, It is every single song in the soundtrack, which, by the way, I, for some godforsaken reason, own on vinyl. But every (laughs) single song in this is the exact same melody. Um, But you can understand the plot and the characters just by listening to that. You can pick up... Obviously, the songs represent the character's mood and emotions, but I really like the idea of repurposing a melody for a cheery opening. Oh, now it's the same melody, but it's a suicide scene, and now it's the same melody, but we're in a different universe, and it kind of is repurposed in great ways. And I think the way that it's put together, which is a whole theme with the entire game, but it very much satirizes but also appreciates kind of the source material. It's taking a lot from Moe animes, and it's it's kind of criticizing the simplicity and the bubbliness of that, but also appreciating it, and I think you can pick that all up in the music. I think the performance is fantastic. When I was playing through the game, I was very disappointed originally that there wasn't any uh, voiceover or vocals for the characters, but I think it's such a great choice to have the characters be silent and the only time you actually hear Mm. a character talk is this moment Mm. and i think that makes it so much more special absolutely i i couldn't agree more i actually recently played the game again and i think what i always forget that i'm running into you know in the game because again you once you know the game you know it's going to be kind Mm. of a horror kind of thing going on and then you there are a lot of tone shifts in this game and it ends on just a note that is bittersweet you know i I always feel like the song is extremely bittersweet and but once you i mean you have to devote a lot of time to get through the novel and i feel that the song at the end is such an interesting way to conclude it and I think there's a lot of different ways you could interpret or take it. I think you could look at it as melancholic. I think you could look at it as, in a weird way, happy. I think you could look at it a lot of different ways, which is another reason why I like it. Yeah, yeah, I love the last lyric here. I'll just read it. How can I write love into reality? If I can't hear the sound of your heartbeat, what do you call love in your reality? And in your reality, if I don't know how to love you, I'll leave you be. It's kind of... Oh, I just it's it's perfect. It's so cool. Uh, I love when games explore. I mean, any media, but we talked about this with David. It works best with games. When games explore the relationship between the person playing a video game and the characters, and sort of like if you form some sort of emotional bond with something that doesn't exist, what does that mean? And I think this game does just a great job of exploring. I mean, that lyric says it all. Mm-hmm. It really does. And the last words is, I'll leave you be, and then it's just like... And then it's gone. It's done. Yep. And uh-huh. I, I know bookends aren't exactly a complex narrative device, but the very first notes you hear 
are the very last notes you hear. The the, mm-hmm. the very first song is your reality, but you don't know that until the end. And I, I, I really like that. I think, you know, I honest, you know, and this is me kind of enjoying that, you know, again, sometimes you always watch something and you're like, oh, I want more. Uh, but I always kind of thought it'd be interesting to hear the other poems in song form. Because you, throughout the game, you see all these different kinds of perspectives of writing. And uh, I think that they end it with a song reminds you that a lot of music is also poetry. Well, you don't see and any of thought, yeah. You don't see any of Monica's poems in the game. This song would be her writing then. Exactly, and I think it's it'd be very interesting to see how a, a, all the other characters would personalize their work with music. Hmm. Yeah. They're making, I don't know, DLC or an expansion. It's or like a something. blue sky I don't know or something the, like that. I've heard about that. I don't know what the heck that's going to be. So, Cusack, what do you got for us next? All right. The next one I'm going to, we're going to go a little bit classic here. We are going to do Cuphead, Threatening Zeppelin. That's what the song is called. Is it the one with the the Zeppelin woman, I'm guessing, with the pointy nose? Yeah, it's, yeah the one with the plane, for sure. And I, I I wanted to pick a song from Cuphead, and I think I was struggling a lot because the inside the entire soundtrack is gold. Yes. And I, I was this close. I was this close to picking the dice one. Mm, that's a good one. Or even the flower one is good too. That mm. one's good too. I think the reason why I picked this one is because I have a bias when it comes to classic cartoons. Uh, I love I love cartoons a lot, and I have a huge appreciation for. The early Bugs Bunny, the early Tom and Jerry. And I think the reason why I have such appreciation for Tom and Jerry specifically is nine times out of ten, there is no speaking. Maybe some side characters will talk, but, you know, back then they had to utilize a full orchestra to communicate what was happening in, you know, the banter between Tom and Jerry. Mm -hmm. And I felt that Cuphead was able to do the exact same thing in gameplay. And the reason why I picked this song in particular is because it reminds me of a battle between Tom and Jerry. Oh, that's cute. It, it does. And, and I think th- I was so, when I, whenever I hear it, I think of, you know, this is a song that makes me want to dance and fight at the same time. Yes. And it's pretty incredible that they can make something, you know, make you feel that way. You have to have a lot of endurance to play Cuphead. <laughs> It is, it is so hard. Me and Charlie and were playing today, and I we go to the well. We have 2,600 deaths. We're about two-thirds through. <laughs> oh, no. And, yeah, and I think what makes the game so satisfying is that, or, or frustrating is that each battle only takes about two minutes. Yeah, a lot of the times even less, when like you, 90 when seconds. When you complete yeah. it. When you complete it. It's and um, I always kind of thought, and again, you have to keep shooting and the the song will replay if you don't kind of keep doing, you know, damage to the the bad guy. But I also kind of enjoy the threatening Zeppelin song because it does kind of remind me a bit of, you know, a plane, a fight. If you were fighting with planes, Mm -hmm. you know, in, in in a classic cartoon setting. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, there, again, there are so many songs I could choose from that one, but I think because it has that, communication of a battle you know and again a lot of them do but you know that tom and jerry kind of background i kind of enjoy really kind of fit with where this one kind of place was was in my heart but like i said the the dice one is really good the flower one's really good um even just the overworld themes are really enjoyable or i love the the salt the 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 barbershop um opening and then uh, Night the, arose. Um, that barber yeah, it's, it, no, it's kind of like. Well, Cuphead and his comic man. And then King Dice says the one who's like, "Oh, I'm King Dice." Yeah, they, 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 he's got a, <laughs> he's got a, a song one too. This get like the song. It really, uh, it's given me like the 1940s jazz club. You know, kind of makes you want to wiggle yeah, your exactly. finger. And it, I think, like you were saying, it kind of ties into the airplane theme because it's like very much like you could see like. The aviator like comes from wherever, or you know, Leonardo then, DiCaprio. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what I love about it, I'm a I'm a percussionist, so the fact that it's like 
huge on the vibraphone is always mm-hmm. a positive thing. Uh, again, with this song, and I think this is kind of a thing that we're seeing throughout all of our picks, is that it develops over time. And it, you know, it, again, has the idea of this, all of the songs in Cuphead have a very straightforward idea of like, we want to, we want to use and make um, songs from that era um, and really pay homage to that era. And this is like even more specific, like we want to do like a dance jazz club song. Um, It's rewarding. Yeah. It kind of makes, and and, and it's funny that you say jazz club because it almost reminds me of like this specific song also makes me think of like, what would happen if all of a sudden a fight just broke out in a jazz club? Mm. <laughs> yeah. You know? Mm. You know? Like, it, mm-hmm. and that's what I enjoy mm-hmm. so much about it is it, it puts a fun play on goofiness on the concept of fighting. And, you know, maybe that's where I find that Tom and Jerry stuff. But for sure, like, I feel that it makes me want to say, put up your dukes. Yeah. You know, that <laughs> specific phrase. Put up your dukes. Let's go. Like, mm-hmm. say, okay. Sonny, why don't you meet me out in the alley and I'll beat you up. She. <laughs> yeah. I feel like you can tell that this is like a project of love and um yeah. just the fact that like it's it repeats, right? Um but the song itself is three minutes long before it repeats, you know? Yeah, like but that. you're not gonna last three minutes is the thing. That's gonna be so rare. <laughs> no. No, it's gonna take you an hour. Yeah, no, I just mean like you, they could have, you know, recorded like a one minute track, and then yeah, they could have it. done ninety seconds. I think what really bothers me too about Cuphead is that it's all completely fair. That mm-hmm. bothers you? It is. It bothers me. No, it bothers me that it's fair because I keep dying. And you know, it's you. you. Know, it's not the game. It's, Did you try it, getting it is not good? The game. It's entirely because I suck. Good. <laughs> yeah, I think you should try getting good. Speaking of getting good. Let's, a transition. Yeah, that's a transition. <laughs> yeah, what do you What do you got, David? No, so the last one I have, and this is great because um, we're going to be able to talk about jazz a couple of times. Um, so the last one I did, it was between one that ultimately somebody else picked, um, and this one. So this is my adult um, pick. So Final Hours was my childhood pick. I forgot Ew. to say that. And the Ice Cap Zone was actually because I played Sonic three when i was in a teenager uh but so i picked up jump up superstar from super mario odyssey for such a, a wide variety of reasons um it's first of all it's just it's just a great song and we'll get to the song in a second but what really makes it fantastic is that it's such it's such an homage to like video game history it's an and event it's, yeah it's an event and it's not, but there's so much care and, and, um, and really intention behind everything that the song is, is made out of, um, that it kind of reminds me of Super Mario Odyssey as a whole, right? It's like, you're, you're taking this franchise and you're paying homage to it, but you're also like really approaching it in a way that is not shallow. And it's not just the same thing repeated over and over. And Jump Up Superstar is the first time that the Mario series really tries to go for that, like, jazz, like, you know, New York City kind of vibe. And it works so well. Well, wait, what about Mario 3D World? That had a jazz soundtrack. Oh, I guess. Come the act. I guess. What do you mean you guess? That's that's actually a jazz. What are you talking about, you guess? I know. (laughs) Well, I always kind of thought that it was like this specific song and even just the whole process of going through the level when it's playing was just, I always kind of thought of it as like a tribute to gamers. Yeah, it's a, it's a, an up. entire tribute to gamers, especially if you've been with Mario <laughs> for the last 20 years. Exactly. And it's, and so like, it's fun. The level that you play it in, it's fun. It's got bright colors and it's got fireworks and everything. So like, if you're a little kid who's just playing Mario for the first time, you'll really enjoy it. But there's so much homage to, you know, Donkey Kong, the arcade game, and then various, like, steps throughout Mario's life in the level. And my favorite part of Jump Up Superstar is, like, a minute and 40 in, they're about to do a key change into the next verse. And the transition theme is, the is like, the trumpets do the jump sound oh, yeah. from Donkey Kong. And they just go... 
and then they go mm-hmm. right into the key change and that acts as like mm-hmm. a transition between the two verses and it's just like so <gasps> good because i just listened once, to it that's cool it's just yeah. once mm-hmm. in the piece it's once in the song and that's it but they were like if you remember this you'll know what it is and it gets you amped up for the next verse yeah and it's just it's so it's it's re- and like it's got really not very like meaningful lyrics it's all about, about like let's have fun together yeah. let's support each other and what i really enjoy about it is it's so earnest and like mm-hmm. seeing video games as like let's just have fun let's be upbeat and enjoy mm-hmm. the experience and mm-hmm. you know the other pieces i've had i've talked about aren't necessarily that way but it's great to see it synthesized into a piece that's like constructed and made so lovingly um and it has lyrics and it has lyrics um (laughs) um, jump with me and grab coins with me oh yeah it (laughs) doesn't have to be complex (laughs) it's just people are afraid people are are, i know composers are afraid to try it i think a lot of the times and i think it's something that if you pull it off right can have a lot of payoff it's a moment that it's like i said it's an event that i mean i knew the song because it was part of the trailer but in the context of the the part of the game that it's in that is a memorable moment that is a key mario moment that people will remember for another 25 years that is by f- i mean that's by far my favorite level in a mario game it's just so great um hmm. and it's not and what i like about it it's not they're not trying to be cool they're not trying to be um like emotional and like a tearjerker kind of way it's just like let's just go in there and have fun and be upbeat and what a lot of what i enjoy about it is because a lot of the criticism of nintendo it's like oh these are just toys these are just fun things they're not serious then therefore they're not real games we're not gonna try to be like edgy for you we're just gonna be earnest in what we like enjoy doing in the same vein even like in that coolness sense you could see a Sonic game attempting this exact same set piece and doing it horribly. Yeah. Just like completely misunderstand. It doesn't matter what the genre is. Just like <laughs> mis- misunderstanding what makes your own creation important. And I think this, I think you can see that the composer, the singer, everybody on board understands what makes Mario Mario and why people enjoy it. Yeah. Whether if it's the simplicity or any any factor of that. It's it's just great. I love it. And I listened to it like four times in the car today when I was <laughs> driving to Menards. I <sighs> love it. The game's also in Tanko. Oh. All right. Eli, what's your last piece you'll be gracing uh, us with? Cool. Uh, So my last one is Hymn of the Faith from Final Fantasy X. Um, I replayed this this year because they made a remastered version on the switch and i forgot how how influential it was in my childhood and like coming back to it and being like whoa like i actually get these themes now and like i yeah um so i don't think any of you have played the game right okay so the premise of the game is like there is this godlike monster that is called Sin, and he is, um, like kind of come. He comes back every like ten years or so, and just like mercilessly kills a bunch of people, um, and through like because of their like use of technology and stuff like that, um, and there are these people called summoners who have the ability to summon aeons and like um pray to like the gods and like and pray for mercy mercy and whatsoever you know all that stuff um and so there's a lot of themes of like faith and faith through adversity and it's just and like and doubt and all of these like themes that are really really complex and when you walk into the temple you hear this theme and I remember as a kid, I would just like sit in that temple and listen to this song like over and over and over and over again. Um, I don't know if it was because I was so into choir at the time or if, like this game actually made me 
appreciate choir more, but just like, um, I don't know, seeing it outside of the context of church and like in a video game, I kind of realized how important like the idea of multiple voices coming together as an act of faith, um, is, uh, yeah. So just like the real voices in this, in this track give it a really human, um, feel. I mean, considering how early the game came out, it's like a pretty old game now. Like they definitely could have used it, used like synthesized voices to, um, to make this track, but they didn't. They used like a real choir, which I thought was just, I don't know. It's hard to, hard to really put into words how this song makes me feel. I don't know. What I really liked about it is that it sounds very much like you are you would be in like a cathedral. So mm. they somehow designed it where you have the full choir, but it still has that echoey, like I don't know what like tallness to it, where yeah, like yeah, you yeah. can hear it reverberating. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. Which again, like you could have just had them like go to a recording booth and then played it, you know, had them or whatever and record them and eliminate all that background noise. But then you would miss out on the, you know, the lived experience of what it would actually be like to be in a church like that with that huge choir. Mm hmm. Yeah. Also, something super cool about um, the lyrics of the piece is if you it's like it's actually a puzzle, which I think is really cool, really creative. Ooh, that's um, good. So the lyrics are let me find them. Ie yui nobo meno ren miri yoju yogo hasate kanai kutamai, which sounds Japanese if you don't speak Japanese, but it's not. Um, if you take the words and you place them in a certain way, it actually spells out like this prayer, which says, Pray to you, Yevin, dream faith forever and ever, grant us prosperity. Um, Ooh, interesting. Square yeah, which is, man. They're really intense yeah um yeah super cool love that game i uh, would totally recommend playing it it's got a lot of really challenging themes that i love so trap um, doing it doing it another u-turn <laughs> uh, well kind of i don't know um I, I put the last surprise down for this but i'm basically just talking about the entirety of persona 5 soundtrack you could Replace it with Beneath the Mask or the remix of the Velvet Room Theory or any, basically any song from this. Which, what really stands out to me is, I think if you look at its parts laid out, uh, Persona 5 is actually a very basic game. The gameplay is not complex. The story, the plot, the characters are not at all complex. Um, in fact, I think Persona 4 is actually much better writing, but that's not the point. Um... But what Persona 5 does is it uses the things that can often be afterthoughts in video games to elevate it. It has such a strong cohesion between its themes, its art design, and its music. If you go back to Persona 4, uh, the themes were kind of uh, the you that you hide from society, or being yourself, or being honest, and the colors were all very yellow and pink. And the music was 70s, 80s kind of synth pop, which is good. But I think Persona 5 expands on this in a, in a much better way. It, it's, it, I'm getting word salad here, but it's much clearer. The theme is anarchy and rebellion. The colors are red and black. And the music is jazzy. In fact, a lot of the songs, even though they obviously aren't, sound kind of improvisational. And I think that the creators kind of knew how strong these elements were because the opening, you have a song and an animation, the art and the music are in the forefront. And I think that this is just a great example of something where giving attention to those things can really elevate your game. Giving the music its own distinct feel, which honestly I didn't even talk about or describe very much, but I think it helps create the world once again. Yeah. What I really, last surprise is, <clears throat> yeah. oh, so good. You never see you come, man. It's just that, like, oh, every time such a good, that part uh, hits when I'm playing yeah, it, I was just like, 
every single battle in the, the 90 first, hours yeah, that I played Not even that, that part. ever Because I don't even make it to that part a lot. You're zooming through these battles. Yep. So, like, every five minutes, it's that... And it's still so good every single time you play. Wait, so I, this is the just the theme that you that plays every when you have single a, battle encounter? you play in this 110 hour RPG minus like the big bosses plays this song from the beginning. They don't even yeah. they don't even cycle it through so we can pick up where it left <laughs> off. It starts it from the beginning, which is a horrendous idea. But it's the right song, the right game, and the right themes, it's, and it works great. It's a horrendous <laughs> idea in every other game. I have mm-hmm. not played a. I'm sure there are other games, but I've never played a game before where the battle theme is a orchestrated like vocal song. Um, yeah. Uh, and like it could, like Travis said, it could so easily be like muddy. It could so easily be take away from it. But it could yeah, be distracting. Not... But like the ba- <laughs> This is so stupid. I would purposely play the game, and there are these special like attacks, basically, where you kind of have. The character performs it. It's like an insta kill, and then there's like a little card that kind of shows up on the screen. If you've played it, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Um. But like, it's cool because then the character like does this pose on the screen, and I try to line it up like with yeah, the and I know what you mean. Song, and I'm like, oh, that's so good. It's so this this <clears throat> was the song I, I almost did in yeah. Jump Up Superstar. It's so fun. It's so it's so like doesn't even when you can't hear the lyrics because you're still playing, it's like you still get the theme of the song. You still understand why it's like playing. The, the song that plays after a battle when you get your results screen is also great. Beneath mm-hmm. the Mask, that's the one that plays when you're just walking around town. I, I guess I don't really know how to describe what's jazz and what's not, but I cannot think of a single other game where on your entire soundtrack, I think the bass is the defining instrument. Yep. Mm. Every one of the songs, the bass is the key element. And it's like you mm. never see that, but it works so well. And it's, mm. yeah. I forgot. I forgot on the Jump Up Superstar one. It the jump No, up we don't, su- you don't get to go back. No, no, no. I'm just saying, I'm, I'm, I'm connecting the basses. Um, so with, with Cusack's, uh, the Cuphead one, that's very much big band, which isn't necessarily as bass heavy. Um, Jump Up Superstar was very like 60s and 70s jazz where it's like the walking bass became a huge part of of like the jazz back mm-hmm. bone. And so Travis's with The Last Surprise, it's kind of like <clears throat> the bass is more important, but you no longer have the bass just playing the quarter notes or the eighth notes, but they mm-hmm. have like an importance beyond that. And that really is like the jazz that they're taking examples from and they're drawing inspiration from is kind of a newer form of jazz. Yeah, exactly. The bass leads a lot of the songs in this game. Mm-hmm. So good. It's like disco. You guys should play it. It's so good. I, oh my god, I want to play it so bad. Kuzek oh, doesn't have so the attention bad. span for it. I'm working on it. I'm busy with some other stuff, but it's. I still have your copy at, but it is in my to do Makoto's the best. No, 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 yes. no. You just like her because she's a nerd. Yes, uh, that's why the like the shogi player, um, Hifumi, she was the best. Oh, okay, <laughs> okay. And Cusack, um, to round out our yeah. Oh my podcast. god, how long have we been going? We've been going for We've... almost an hour and a half. Yep, uh, we're an hour and twenty. Okay, yep. So can Cusack, sing, you're our can last I one. Sing? Can I sing? Can I sing? Yes, it? yes, please. All right, here we go. Oh. Oh, we're still we're doing the whole song. Okay. There we go. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> Halo, baby, let's go. Halo theme. Why did you, why yes. did you stop singing? Let's go. Because that's all the chorus part. The rest is instrumental. Dude, let's talk about Halo. Let's do this. So, 
I I don't think any of you guys have actually played it, have you? I have played Halo 1 and 2 to completion and a lot of the multiplayer. Okay, awesome. I I, I don't know why, but I I didn't... I thought for some reason you said you never played them, Travis. But I've uh, I've only played them, like, here and there. I've never played them all the way through. But but, I played the multiplayer, that's for sure. I actually don't have nostalgia with Halo that much. I've played a lot of multiplayer at, like, my friends' houses because I didn't ever own the games. But recently, I got the Master Chief Collection. I played through the whole thing, and boy, I feel that I missed out in my childhood because these games were freaking awesome, especially the first three games. I loved them. And I think the reason why I loved the Halo theme so much is because, especially with the first game, I feel that this theme encapsulates uh, is that the right encapsulates. word uh, encapsulate there it is yeah there i'm not an english major i'm a social worker anyway <laughs> so uh but it, it it the entire mood of the game you know it's the mystery of what is the halo you know with the first game what is going on and you know there's a lot of mystery there's horror and there's a lot of you know weight on our main character's shoulders the master chief uh, you know, as much as he's kind of the top guy, everybody and everything relies on him. And I think this beginning Halo theme song really encaps, you know, it, it, it puts it all in there. You know, at first it, the little, the, the chorus in the beginning really kind of, you know, it represents kind of the, you know, the hardship of war. But then when the beat comes in, it's like, all right, we're done being sad. We got to fight. And I think I really enjoy how that song really amps up people to kind of want to, you know, fight in the war as well as learn what's what's up with the Halo. Why is this thing here? And, you know, when the game goes on, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but when you discover the flood, I I feel like they presented it. Well, well, uh, I'll make it brief, Eli, but essentially it's humans versus aliens, and then when you go on this giant halo weapon, you discover that there's this parasite alien that literally will take over anything, and it's disgusting Hmm. and horrifying. And I think what I really like about it is that, you know, uh, it, you know, it, the, the, the steam really creates the, um, you know, the ambiance of war as well as the struggle of, someone who is very skilled at war and i I, in in many ways i feel that master chief feels alone with his ai cortana you know he really communicates with her the entire time and he has people along the way who he kind of talks to but i feel that it's that connection that also really um is involved with his struggle throughout the war and the process uh I really like um, how there's also kind of a brotherhood with this theme. Uh, have you guys ever seen the memes or the videos of a bunch of dudes singing the song in the bathroom? Because the uh, yeah, acoustics. yeah. I, I I was yeah YouTubing to search listen to the theme and I saw that and then I also saw this really cool video of the uh, composer playing the guitar riff for the first time. Like he was watching it on the screen and he had an electric guitar and he was like, he had his eyes closed and he was really jamming out. I didn't know if he was coming up with it then and there, but he was so into it. It was a really cool video. See, I, I, I don't think I would ever really work well in the army, but I feel like if I ever had to fight, this is the song that kind of makes me feel that I have a brotherhood with people. Very masculine, very masculine. I, in, in a lot of ways, but, I think what I also really like about it is that, you know, it's, you know, there's a lot, I mean, yeah, masculine is probably a really good word for it, just because I feel that I, I want to get together with my bros and we're going to go accomplish some give shit. each other hugs. We're going to give each other some major hugs. Well, what I was going to say, I think what, kind of how we talked before about how it's really easy for these AAA games to fall in the generic fantasy, big brass, like long strings melody um it's really easy to fall in that trap and i think what surprised me so much of of listening to this i haven't heard the theme in so long is that it packs so many different themes and ideas within those three minutes but it all does so in like a succinct and like logical way um Mm -hmm. where like you do have strings you do have brass you do have like driving drum beats but 
you know, rather than being eighth notes, they're all triplets. And rather than starting out with the intensity, they're starting out with the hymn. And it adds those those little tweaks here and there um, to make it more memorable than just your typical, you know, um, generic monster movie, uh, not monster, like space movie um, or, you know, triple A video game fantasy genre um, music. And it really plays with that, which is kind of ironic because Halo was kind of the start of this genre um, and met in, or at least the start of that era of the genre in many ways. Um, Correct me if mm -hmm. I'm wrong, but this is the only video game song that the uh, Hudson High School marching band performed. I think that's 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 a unique honor. I don't think anybody else can take that. It. (laughs) I mean, I mean, does I mean, in my opinion, the theme makes you, it makes you feel ready for hardship, and you feel that you're gonna, uh, you're gonna approach it with ambition, even though it's gonna be a struggle. Yeah, you know, it amps you up for it amps you up for struggle and makes you feel a bit better about it. It makes you want to fight, you know, yeah. for your right to party. <laughs> oh my god! So, um, it's been long, and we're getting tired. Um, mm. This is our longest podcast I, to I, date. But so, um, oh if man. we if we got to think about some lesson, here's what mm. I have kind of heard throughout the discussion: is that the music to a game. It, it has to have an intention behind it. And like Travis was talking about with Persona, it's one of those things where it's really easy to just kind of treat the music like another thing that needs to be ticked off. Um, like, mm-hmm. oh, our video game needs music. Let's just throw this generic thing on there. Yeah, it can't be an afterthought. It has to be something that's built for the ground up, for um, with the game and the characters and the ideas and the gameplay. Any of these elements have to be congruent to the music. And I think what all the pieces that we've been talking about do that really well, where they're matching the tone and the ideas and the themes and the um, the general music, like playing outside of the actual song itself. It, it, everything we've talked about tie all those things together really well. Yeah. yeah. All right. I agree. Thank you so much for listening, <laughs> everybody. <laughs> <laughs> What's your favorite song? Leave a comment. Leave a comment yeah. below. Which one? Are there any? Are there any songs that you're like? Why was that on the list? Here's a better yeah, one. Yeah, if you want to, um, uh, tell us to delete it. Um, delete it bald. You know, whatever. Let us know. If you want to fight about <laughs> Breath of the Wild in the comments, I'll fight. If you think that Travis should just leave all the Undertale stuff to me, let me know. <laughs> yeah, you know. All right. Yeah. Bye, everybody. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Game Detectives Podcast. Oh, and don't forget... Halo, baby! Let's go! Halo theme! Yes! Bye! Thank you so much for playing my game.